Welcome to Lecture 13 of Statistical Rethinking 2023. When I was a kid, we were really into books. Uh, it was the early days of the internet, and I guess, you know, books were pretty cool. So at the library, we used to uh, exchange these choose-your-own-adventure books, and they came in lots of exciting titles like Mystery of the Maya, Island of Time, Cup of Death, what was great about these books is that, well, they were distracting and entertaining, but they're a kind of book where you get to choose branching paths, like the Garden of Forking Pass, the Garden of Forking Data, uh, from the first half of the course. You reach a particular page and you're given a choice and you choose which page to turn to next and the story continues from there. And many, many stories are embedded in a single book through this branching path mechanism. Uh, so for this particular book, The Island of Time, this is its map, and uh, there are 12 possible endings. And from a causal inference perspective, these books are relevant because you can explore counterfactuals, uh, see what would have happened if you had done something else, the sort of thing we can never really do in real data analysis. <clears throat> Not all of these adventures are as simple as the previous one. Uh, the Mystery of the Maya, for example, has many, many more possible endings, 39 in total, uh, many other, many branching decisions that lead to those, and the possibility of returning to the start of uh, various points uh, for looping paths, a uh, directed cyclic graph, if you will. Uh, why am I talking about uh, kids' books? Well, um, in this course, uh, I've encouraged you to follow this idea of drawing the Bayesian owl, that there's this five-step plan to success where we start with a clearly defined theoretical estimate, uh, then we uh, use that to sketch out some causal models, uh, make them into real generative models that can produce synthetic data, and then we use those two steps to build statistical models through the logic either of do calculus or by expressing the generative model directly as a statistical model. Uh, then we need to test. Quality assurance is necessary. Uh, we sim use simulations from the generative model to validate uh, the estimator. Uh, and then, only then, are we ready to analyze the real data. The disservice with this outline, of course, is that you know just from the course material and the homework assignments that it's much more complicated than this. There are branching paths. It's not a straight line from one to five. There are lots of little subjective decisions that have to be made in between. Uh, it's much more like this, the mystery of the model, and there are many, many possible endings, more than 39 for sure. But reassuringly, when you reach a bad ending and your model doesn't work, you can return to the start and fix it. And those are the tools that it's my responsibility to teach you. And part of that is when drawing a real owl, for example, there are many technical skills involved and technical details from the choice of pencil uh, to how you hold it. Uh, and everybody knows that in every art form. Or, um, and the analogy in statistical modeling are these little things about estimators and coding them and making them run, like the partial pooling thing that I showed you in the previous lecture last week. Uh, these are things that don't really appear in the generative model typically. But if we leave them out, we leave information on the table. Uh, we could do better if we pick up that information and incorporate it correctly. So I want to introduce you to your multi-level adventures, the sorts of branching paths uh, that will lead you to good estimation. Um, and from this point on in the course, I think the foundations are in place. Once you've got the basics of partial pooling, you've got a really strong foundation in advanced statistical modeling. And from there, you can choose to invest uh, as little or as much as you want in any particular sub area. There's no obligation to learn it all. Uh, that's the way I think of it is the, this course up to the first multi-level modeling uh, lecture is a foundational thing that most behavioral scientists and biological scientists need. And after that, you choose to specialize. And so from here, I'd like to propose some, um, some uh, choices, some branching paths for all of you who've been following along in the lectures or taking the course. And the first, of course, is to return to the start. Start again from the first lecture, come back through, 
uh, take notes on what you didn't understand the first time and really reinforce your foundation because that foundation is the most important thing. And after you've repeated that foundation, you'll feel much better because you'll understand it much better the second time through. Uh, it'll give you a warm glow. And then you'll be in a much better position to decide what you want to do next. Uh, you could also, for the rest of this course, uh, skim and index what remains. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. Just try to learn uh, to learn the details. Just sit back, be entertained, see the kinds of applications that are possible. Uh, index them in your mind so that if you come across a research problem where you need something like that, you can come back to this material uh, and choose to go in as deeply as you need to. Um, Third, you could pick and choose. Uh, you could skip over whole examples. I will not be offended uh, and engage only with those topics that interest you because from here on out, it's going to get more specialized. Um, this lecture and the next are not too specialized, uh, but uh, they will get increasingly specialized in the week after. And we'll look at uh, topics like social networks and phylogenies, and it's perfectly fine not to be interested in those topics. Uh, but if you are interested in those topics, then wait for those and focus on those. You don't just you don't have no obligation to focus on the other pieces. Um, fourth option is what I call the Bayesian flow, which is what I've been encouraging from the beginning. Uh, try to learn enough in each part just to keep moving, just to hang on, and that's fine. You you don't. I think it's actually a bit foolish to try to understand everything on the first go, uh, but just enough to keep moving, so that you're learning a little bit. And then you can uh, do it all again at some point. Or, better yet, um, stop and engage with your own research problems uh, when you feel ready. And if you reach a stopping point, a block, a wall in your own research problems, then you can come back here uh, and find some help. So, uh, the distinction that I need um, to prepare you for so that you can branch out and choose your paths is this distinction between clusters and features in multi-level models. And basically every kind of advanced statistical model or machine learning model is some kind of multi-level model. So this distinction is very useful uh, no matter what you end up doing later. So clusters are the groups, the subgroups in the data. Um, uh, things like tanks uh, in the tadpole example, stories in the trolley example, individuals also in the trolley example or in the tadpole example or departments in the uh, uh, berkeley admissions data example these are uh, subsets in which there are multiple observations <clears throat> and then there are features and these are aspects of the model uh, things we'd like to estimate quite typically that may vary by cluster um, and the way we program these different things into the models is the thing you want to get clear. And so I'm going to do another lecture uh, uh, today, which basically uh, repeats and um, gets a bit more involved in the material from the previous lecture. So in a sense, there's not going to be anything new. And yet I hope it feels like it's a bit new because it's good to reinforce this basic distinction and understand what's going on. And this will give me an opportunity to start introducing uh, some of the uh, branching paths and uh, in the mechanism of really making this stuff work. Um, so in the machinery, when you choose to add more clusters, so often in a particular problem, there's not just one kind of cluster uh, that you want to structure by, um, not just tanks, uh, not just stories, but also individuals and, and other things. Maybe not just regions of countries, but countries themselves as well. When you add more clusters to the data, I actually think this is the least complicated thing. Uh, you need more index variables. So it's just categorical variables like before, um, and you just need to add population priors for each. So this is not the hard problem uh, at, at all. It's just copying and pasting and renaming parameters for the most part. Adding features is where the subtlety lies, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, when you add features, you add parameters, sometimes quite a lot of parameters, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands. Um, and what this means is there are more dimensions in each population prior because there are more aspects of each cluster which can vary, and this leads to additional complexity and additional interpretation issues. 
So I'm going to slowly move through an example, which I'll build over this lecture and the next to help you understand um, uh, this, this uh, engineering, if you will, and why it's really useful for research. One of the things that helps me not get too lost in the possible branching paths is to keep reminding myself what I'm trying to do, right? This is step one of drawing the L. Uh, and varying effects for us are a way to try to estimate unmeasured confounds. Uh, this is quite often what they're for. Um, confounds in the soft sense of competing causes or confounds in the hard sense of common causes that are unobserved. So the varying effect strategy to remind you is uh, we have unmeasured features of the clusters. Um, we believe they exist or, they, or we're worried that they exist and these leave some imprint on the data. Uh, but we have multiple observations from each cluster and this gives us the possibility to actually estimate things we have not measured. Um, and the reason <clears throat> we use uh, partial pooling is because it gives us better estimates of those things because it borrows strengths from across the clusters. From a predictive perspective, this is important because it gives us better estimates. It makes us more accurate in our predictions. Uh, it gives us regularization. From a causal perspective, there are inferential threats. Um, the, un the things we have not measured are the most terrifying things. Uh, but, but repeat observations within clusters give us some hope. You've already seen some examples of this. Uh, think back to the introductory causal inference lectures. This example of grandparents, uh, education of grandparents' influence on the education of their own children and their grandchildren. And I um, introduced the idea uh, of this haunting that neighborhoods um, induce shared exposures between parents and their kids. And this is a thing that stops us from doing a mediation analysis on this, on, on measuring the direct effect of grandparents on their children. Um, but if we have families in the same neighborhoods, then we have repeat observations on those neighborhoods, and then we can use um, uh, estimation, varying effects estimates, uh, to estimate those unmeasured features of neighborhoods, potentially. In the trolley problem example, <clears throat> I ended that example by talking about the fact that uh, each individual had responded to, I think, 30 different trolley problems, and uh, individuals vary a lot in how they make use of the subjective scale, and that adds a lot of noise to the responses. And this is a competing cause. If we could estimate those individual features, uh, let's just call it personality, that affects how reactive they are to the scale, that would help us get better estimates of the treatment effects. I think it's also quite likely uh, in that particular experiment that these individual features also affect participation. Uh, and therefore, um, those individual unmeasured individual features may be a confound. Uh, and so it's even worse than that. Yeah. Uh, that there's sampling bias uh, through those personality features. Um, a pol political science example. So uh, I had a colleague uh, back in California who was really interested in why some countries go to war and some governmental forms go to war. Uh, there's this there's this kind of folk saying that democracies never go to war against one another. Um, and uh, so you can imagine in a schematic, you've got this idea that um, uh, you have some time series and uh, there are periods in which different nations are at war with one another and they have different governmental forms, G1 and G2 at that time. And you've measured some other stuff about them, like their economies and, and uh, so on. Those are the X1 and X2 variables of the, of the countries 1 and 2. And the problem in inference in this, which makes this a sort of never-ending debate, is that <clears throat> there are lots of potentially unmeasured things about nations that can influence all of these variables and therefore are confounds. Um, things like their geography, their natural resources, uh, their cultural history, and so on. Um, and these are um, things that we might be able to estimate with repeat observations. So the point of all these examples is to say um, we're interested in varying effects both from a predictive perspective because they regularize and from a causal inference perspective because it's a chance for us um, to estimate um, 
unobserved, unmeasured um, confounds. There's an alternative approach called the fixed effect approach. Uh, if you watched the, one of the bonus rounds from last week, I described it there. Uh, but if you didn't, very quickly, fixed effects are varying effects with um, a, an infinite standard deviation. And so they don't do any pooling at all. In effect, they use only the data from each individual cluster to estimate features of that cluster. Uh, this leads them to overfit, yes, uh, but they they have some advantages in dealing with group level confounds, as I described in that bonus round. Um, they have the disadvantage of not allowing you uh, to study uh, cluster level uh, uh, causes. Uh, uh, in the bonus round, I, I argued that uh, there are plenty of times when fixed effects are fine. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to show you one of the reasons that in realistic research with finite sample sizes, uh, they're often quite impractical. And the good news is um, they don't offer any unique benefits over, over varying effects. Uh, we can deal with group level confounds and varying effects as well, as I described in that bonus round. But in general, um, with all these terms flying around like fixed effects and varying effects, don't panic. Uh, draw your assumptions, make the generative model, and focus on that. Uh, to get your thinking straight first and worrying about the worry about the estimator later because most of the big problems in research are about getting the story straight yeah okay lots of practical difficulties and that's sort of what we're focusing on here varying effects are great uh, as a default i often tell people that um, we shouldn't be making excuses to use varying effects we should be making excuses not to and sometimes there are uh, good excuses not to um, and sometimes it's the practical difficulties, for example. How do we use more than one cluster at the same time? Um, and as I told you, you duplicate, uh, but it's easier said than done in many cases. You need examples if you're going to make progress there. Calculating predictions with varying effects gets trickier because now you have to talk about at what level you're making predictions. Are you making predictions for whole new clusters, or are you making predictions for new elements inside of previously experienced clusters? And those are really different kinds of predictions. I'm going to say that again because I know this is weird. Um, so imagine we were making a prediction for a new tadpole uh, in an existing uh, context that we had varying effect estimates for. That's a different kind of prediction task than making predictions for new unobserved tanks that tadpoles might appear in. Yeah, uh, we need to use different parameters from the models to make those different kinds of predictions. And then there's just this uh, issue of drawing the owl. How do we get the chains to sample efficiently? And as you make models more complicated, this gets harder. Uh, but don't worry. Uh, I am here. You don't have to go alone, and I'll show you the tricks. Uh, fourth, uh, group level confounding. This is a real threat in models, and it's often ignored in the varying effects literature. Uh, it's something to really think about. And as I said in the bonus round from last week, I showed you um, one effective way to deal with this that's essentially equivalent to the fixed effect approach. The example I want to stick with in this lecture and the next is um, the 1989 Bangladesh Fertility Survey. So uh, Bangladesh is a very densely populated country, and in the 1980s, a typical woman, um, by the time she finished uh, her reproduction, would have had seven or eight kids. I think that was the median. And these days, it's around two. Uh, so there's been a radical demographic change in, in the last decades. Um, in Bangladesh, as in many parts of the world, um, uh, much of Asia. And uh, uh, there are many good reasons to study this change, um, uh, both descriptively and causally. Uh, descriptively, because uh, countries need to understand what's happening to them so that they can plan appropriately. And causally, because as human scientists, we want to understand why this happened. So I'm going to give you um, a relatively modest data set here that's in the rethinking package, uh, so Data Bangladesh. It's uh, 1,934 women from 61 districts in Bangladesh. And uh, Bangladesh is a uh, highly variable place uh, uh, with cities and rural areas. 
and the outcome we're going to be interested in is contraceptive use. This was a, a survey in the 1980s, uh, late 1980s of contraceptive use when it was just being uh, um, heavily pushed by the, by the government. We have some other variables we're going to think about too, just to make this spicy. Um, the age of the woman that was interviewed, uh, how many living children she had at the time, and um, whether the, her location within the district is urban or rural. <clears throat> so lots of people request um, more advice about how to draw DACs. This is extremely common. So, uh, and, and my response is always, well, you need domain expertise, and that's true. But I think there are some heuristics as well that can help. So let me, let me try uh, with this case to show you how I would go about trying to, trying to draw DAG with just these variables. Of course, there are other variables that matter, but hang on, we're going to get there. Let's, let's not punish ourselves. Let's start simple. So the variables uh, we're going to nominate so far, we've got contraceptive use. That's our outcome of interest. We've got the age of the woman, how many uh, living kids she has. Um, urbanity, I'm calling it. Does she live in an urban area or not? Uh, or in principle, you could make that a continuous variable. How urban is the space um, or distance from an urban center? And then the district, which is this variable, which is just an index. But remember, we're interested in it because it's going to represent unmeasured things about districts that may affect uh, all the women and all the families within them. So first thing you can do is focus on the cause of interest. What are the causes of interest? Why are you doing this research at all? Uh, and in this case, we're going to think about the idea that we would like to, um, at minimum, describe the association between age and contraceptive use and, uh, and, and family size and contraceptive use, how many kids the woman has, um, and possibly even estimate causal effects of these things. Although, uh, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see, that's, that's not so easy to do. Um, then there are competing causes, other things that influence the outcome. Uh, but we're, that we're not necessarily directly interested in, but that we may want to stratify by um, so we can get better estimates or deal with confounding. So uh, naturally the district um, uh, may influence contraceptive use because there may be many things about the economy of a district or its resources or its population density or its cultural history, which may also influence the behavior of people in it. And then urban spaces and rural spaces are quite different as well. Um, and then there are relationships among those causes. So in this case, uh, um, age, nothing influences age. This is a great thing about the variable age. Nothing influences it because it's just a clock. And uh, unless you have a time machine, you don't have an arrow into age. Uh, but age can influence other things like how many kids you have. The longer you've been alive, the po uh, more kids you can possibly have, right? And um, urban living may also influence kids because of the cost of them. Uh, and um, the district you're in, again, could uh, easily influence urban living because some districts don't have cities. Yeah. Uh, you could draw more arrows here. I'm not making a strong argument for this particular diagram. I'm trying to stimulate your imagination. But I think these relationships are a plausible start so that we can do something useful and um, educational. Uh, there are also unfortunate relationships. You shouldn't just draw the stuff that's easy for you. Imagine... Imagine the haunting. Imagine the ghosts in the dark. Uh, so, for example, here's a group level confound. The unmeasured things about districts may also influence features of individuals in those districts, not just the group level variables, like whether there are cities. So, for example, there may be things about the history of particular districts which influence family size. Uh, it could be the ethnic composition of that district, for example. Um, and then imagine stuff you haven't measured that may also uh, haunt you. So in this case, uh, um, families can be quite large. Uh, and remember I said in the, in around 1980, a typical woman would have had seven or eight kids. So they're going to be a bunch of sisters within a family and they may be similar in contraceptive use and their family sizes because of common socialization. Uh, this is another kind of cluster variable, but if we don't have it in the data set, uh, then, um, uh, it could be a confound. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. Uh, don't panic. We're going to start real simple and build up one step at a time. And we're just going to think about uh, building the tadpole level version of this data set. And what I mean by that is we're just going to cluster by district and describe the variation in contraceptive use by district. And this is already a lot to do, and there's lots of advanced statistical machinery already in this. 
Um, so we don't need to push too much harder until we've got this done. Uh, and often when you're doing a data analysis on a structured data set like this, this is always the place to start. Get your varying effect structure in place, get it to work right, because there's often some tinkering to do, as I'll show you, and then worry about the causal effects uh, uh, second. But, but whatever you do, never try to go to the endpoint and put all of the variables in you think you need. You've got to build it one step at a time because something's not going to work. Uh, and uh, if you've done it all at once, you won't know what's not working. One step at a time, test and keep going. So our S demand is very modest right now. It's just contraceptive use in each district. And we're going to use partial pooling. And you'll see that's being necessary for the survey because the coverage is not very uniform. And in some districts, there just isn't a lot of data. Um, so we're going to estimate a varying intercept on each district. And this really, from my perspective, is just another chance to help you understand partial pooling because let's face it, it's weird. Here's the model we want. Uh, this has the same structure as the tadpole model from last week. Um, but still, uh, let's rem I want to remind you of the pieces and what they mean. The first line, this is the uh, uh, prior for the uh, observed outcome variable, right? There's Bernoulli with some uh, constant rate p sub i, where p sub i is a function of the, of the log odds parameter alpha, um, which is the log odds of contraceptive use in each district. And then we have our regularizing prior for districts. This is a prior with parameters inside of it. And that's the third line of this model. These are the alpha j's. Um, and then uh, alpha bar is the uh, average district, the log odds of contraceptive use in the average district. And sigma is the standard deviation among districts. Here's the code. This looks um, very much like the, the code from last week. Uh, however, I want to call your attention to just one thing, um, and uh, we'll get to it in a moment. Uh, so the top line is not new at all. Uh, this is our Bernoulli outcome, a 0-1 outcome for contraception, because that's the way it was recorded. Uh, then we have our, our link function, logit, for the probability, and we have um, A as our log odds, bracketed by district D. And then here's the new bit. Um, I'm defining the vector a not by bracketing with d but by explicitly declaring its length as 61. There are 61 districts uh, in this survey uh, but not all of them were surveyed and so for some of them you don't have any data uh, and so if you bracket by d in that case you're going to end up with an error and I wanted to save you uh, from that problem but otherwise um, uh, it's all the same. You've got a bar and sigma inside the normal and then uh, the priors for those two parameters, uh, those parameters are often called hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are parameters that determine other priors. Uh, it's a weird thing, I know. And then sigma the exponential. You run this model, uh, you will not encounter any difficulties, and it samples extremely efficiently, but you do get a terrifying number of parameters, um, as you see. I think there are 63, uh, 63 parameters in this model. It's really not that much uh, 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 compared to things that we could do. Uh, but it's not the kind of thing you just stare at the, out, uh, at the coefficient table and understand, right? As always, we need to push out predictions and understand from the posterior predictions what the model thinks. So to, to foreground that, um, you have to appreciate the variation in, in um, the amount of sampling that was done in each district. Uh, some of the districts, there are uh, as almost 120 women sampled, like District 1. And in uh, other districts, there are very few, uh, like District 3. I think that's uh, two women sampled in District 3. Um, uh, district 49 has three women, for example. And poor District 54 has none. Uh, there are definitely women living in District 54, but none of them wanted to talk um, to a, uh, a fertility researcher. Uh, this variation is the sort of situation where partial pooling is a huge help because there's much more evidence for some districts. And so we can be very confident about estimates there, uh, but there's much less in others. So let's think about posterior predictions and I'm going to layer them on. Let's, here's the raw data. Um, these uh, black, <coughs> excuse me, black circles are uh, calculated just by taking the number of women who reported using contraception in each district. So the districts are arranged on the horizontal axis uh, from 1 to 61 um, and dividing that by the number of women who responded at all. 
uh, in, in each district. And then you get a proportion reporting. Uh, and that's what these black circles are. Um, so you can see, for example, that uh, in District 3, all of the women who responded, which I think is two, uh, reported using contraception. And then we put on the posterior means for each district. These are the uh, partial pooling estimates, uh, just the pos posterior means of for each. And as you should expect by now, just like in the tadpole example, they're shrunk towards the mean. That's the effect of, of pooling information across districts. Districts that don't have a lot of data get pooled more. Uh, and then here are 89% uh, posterior intervals to give you an idea that there's uncertainty about these. We don't know the mean, right? Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty in each of these cases. And um, I want to spend a little bit of time studying this graph so you understand uh, what we called shrinkage last time, why some of these estimates have moved our some of the red circles, which are the posterior means, are very far away from the black circles, which are the empirical means, um, and others are right on top. Yeah, and uh, this has to do with, well, you guessed it, how much data there is in each district. So let's take some interesting cases here and just label the sample sizes. So they're starting on the left. For district three, only two women responded. That's where that two is on the black circle. And you'll see that the model is not fooled by this. It is not at all confident. Um, that uh, all women in District 3 use contraception, right? It would be a foolish model if it thought so. Yeah. However, if you used a fixed effects model, that's what it would think. Um, and then on the on moving from left to right, uh, we've got some districts with really low reported use, uh, 10 and 11, and they all uh, they have uh, modest sample sizes as well, and their estimates are shrunk towards the mean. So the model does not think that almost no one uses contraception in those districts. Um, again, for um, there's a low one it has 14 observations there in the middle, and uh, all the way far on the right, you'll see the ones at the bottom. Um, District 49, only four women, uh, and, <clears throat> and then one with six and one with ten. I've highlighted also a couple districts that have large sample sizes and have um, sort of pulled their um, uh, district level estimates up above the mean and you'll see those labeled with the 35 sample size and the 45 sample size uh, a bit more women in those districts use contraception than is typical in bangladesh in 1989 but the model has uh, been has agreed to be pulled up because there's more weight of evidence in those cases okay the point here is just to understand uh, that all of this is logical right the model is just following the logic of probability theory and doing what's necessary and that's why um, the shrinkage happens, uh, and it's also why sometimes it doesn't. Interesting case is this district uh, right over here, and you'll notice there's no black dot in this column where I've marked no data, because that's the district, I think it was uh, 49, where there's um, no data at all. Well, not 49, it must be 50-something, 50 54, something like that, uh, where there's no data at all. Nevertheless, there's a posterior distribution for it. Yeah, uh, remember the minimum sample size for Bayesian analysis is zero because you have a prior. In this case, um, uh, this is an informed prior because it's been estimated from all the other districts. And so that estimate, uh, the posterior mean at the red circle and the 89% interval um, for the district where we have no data is in, a, in essence a prediction that comes from, that has been educated by the data from all the other districts. Uh, but but it's not it it's not that it thinks that this uh, district must be like uh, all the other districts. It uses the variation as well because remember we're estimating that sigma parameter, the variance among districts, and that's why it's a bit wider as you can see than the typical district. the The pink band uh, is wider than it is for most other districts. Okay. That's partial pooling, and it, uh, after a while you get really used to it and you come to expect it, and one of the funny things about it, of course, is that it's a reason that we um, don't expect uh, the model to, we don't want the model predictions to exactly recapitulate the sample. I'll say that again. We don't usually want the posterior predictions of the model to exactly recapitulate the sample, because remember, there are features of the sample which are not regular, and we're trying to regularize. Uh, so that's why we use this approach. Note we have done no inference yet, so we can think about that next. 
what about urban living? Um, urban spaces impose uh, different economic costs on people and crowding, uh, and there are cultural effects of urban living as well, um, and uh, opportunities for labor which compete with reproduction and so on. There are many, many theories about this, um, but typically urban populations um, have smaller family sizes and uh, greater uptick of contraception than rural populations. So let's take a look at this. Is it can we at least describe the association between urban living in Bangladesh, Bangladesh in 1989 uh, and contraceptive use and, and maybe squint really hard at it and convince ourselves it's a causal effect? Um, the issue here right away is that district features are potential group level confounds. Different districts have different levels of urban development. And so we need to um, also stratify by district and we want those varying effects in place. Um, ideally, we'd uh, uh, use the Mundlack machine that I talked about before, but I don't want to overcomplicate this example. So if you're interested in that, you can go back to that bonus round and, and take a look. Um, the total effect uh, of, uh, of U, a variable U, which indicates how urban uh, the place where the woman lives, uh, passes also through K, kids, uh, in my DAG. You, you see that. It's got a direct effect and an indirect effect. Um, so this is just a reminder, uh, you don't want to just throw everything into the same model. You got to think about which estimate you're using and only use the right adjustment set for that. If you did stratify by kids, uh, you would block part, perhaps most, uh, of the causal effect of urban living. Here's the model. Uh, there's a lot of choices about how to parameterize this, and I'm going to choose one that I think is, is the most broadly useful because it's a structure that lots of people use when they make these sorts of models, and that is to add a slope, if you will. Uh, so U sub i in the data set I've given you is, is an indicator variable. It's zero when the woman uh, does not live in a city, and it's one when she does, and we're going to have a coefficient in front of that indicator uh, beta, uh, and there's going to be a different beta for each district. Yeah, so it's... it's uh, whole new vector of parameters because we're going to let the effect of urban living vary. Um, so the variable use of I effectively just turns on beta on different lines for different women, depending upon whether they live uh, in a city or not. Um, nothing changes for alpha sub J. We uh, add beta sub J. It's the same kind of structure. We've got a beta bar, which is the mean effect of urban living um, uh, for uh, across districts. And then a scale parameter tau is that weird uh, cute looking T there. Um, and tau is just like sigma, it just has a different name. <clears throat> so uh, alpha sub j is, is the regularizing prior for rural. Beta sub j is the regularizing prior for the urban effect. It's the difference between rural and urban uh, contraception rates on the log odd scale within a particular district j. And then we have the averages and the standard deviations as before. So in a sense, it's, it's the same model. We've just got some duplication and renaming that's been done. And the code shows that, uh, I think, quite clearly. We have another vector of link 61, but it's named B, uh, and it's got its own mean and standard deviation. OK, when you run this, um, not all is well. Uh, you're likely to get uh, some scary messages uh, like this. Uh, warning four of 2,000 transitions ended with a divergence. Uh, and then there's a link, never a good sign. Uh, warning three or four chains had an EBFMI, whatever that means, uh, less than 0.2. Uh, is that good? It sounds bad. There's a word warning in front. And again, there's a link, uh, never a good sign. Um, what's gone wrong here? Well, actually, the Markov chain is, is fine in this particular case, but it's worth paying attention to these warnings because uh, there's a way to fix them. And when you fix them, you'll have a lot more confidence uh, that the estimates are good, and it'll take less time to get them. It'll make it more efficient. Uh, if you look at the uh, Precy output uh, for this model, you'll see that the uh, NF, the effective sample size, and the R hats are not great, especially for tau. Tau has a, uh, I mean, we took 2,000 samples here, um, and uh, tau's effective sample size is 45. That sounds bad. And its R hat is way above one. Um, so uh, and if you look at the trace plot and the trank plot, uh, th these are unhealthy chains. Yeah. 
Now, if you run this model long enough, you're, you're going to get uh, the right posterior distribution in this particular case. Um, but in some cases, when you see warnings like this, no matter how long you run the model, it's not going to fix it. So it's worth taking a little bit of time to figure out how to recode the model, actually, so that it runs better. Um, but let's do that after a break. Uh, go back and review the first half of this. Um, Think about your branching paths again. Maybe go uh, find a copy of a Choose Your Own Adventure book, uh, read it through, uh, and uh, come back whenever you feel like it. I will still be here. So before the break, I had introduced this idea that uh, we could fix the problems with the Markov chain uh, in the in the Bangladesh model that includes uh, urban versus rural. And the trick for doing it is going to seem weird. I'm just going to tell you right now, and I'm not even going to explain why it works in any deep way. But at the end of this week, I'll do a bonus round to explain the details in more depth. I promise. Uh, but for now, I want to keep moving so we have a good flow and you can get the top level concepts instead. So the problem in this particular model arises from the fact that there are priors inside of priors. That is that we have parameters that define the shape of the priors for other parameters. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, it's essential for making uh, varying intercepts work. But it can be challenging to sample because it creates awkward spaces for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to cruise around in. This kind of prior where parameters appear inside uh, the prior for other parameters, uh, like the prior shown in red on the screen, are called centered priors. The idea is that there are uh, parameters which center them or locate them in particular places. But we can re-express this exact mathematical statistical estimator uh, without centering the priors. Here's the idea. I just want to give you the intuition. So um, there's this thing called a z-score. A z-score is a standardized Gaussian deviation. You can calculate it from anything sampled from a Gaussian distribution by subtracting the mean of that distribution and then dividing by the standard deviation. So this formula on the screen, z or z if you prefer, sub j is equal to alpha sub j minus alpha bar. So we're taking the particular value alpha sub j and subtracting the mean, and then we divide uh, uh, the remainder by sigma. And that's called the z-score. It's a deviation in a standardized normal distribution. It's used in a bunch of statistical tests. You can do this with any normal distribution. It's a perfectly harmless transformation. You can always reverse it. In fact, to reverse it, you just use this formula. Uh, alpha sub j is alpha bar plus the z-score for that j times sigma, and then you're right back on the original scale. So we can use this trick uh, to do all of the posterior updating on the z-scores. And what's nice about that is that the z-scores don't have any parameters inside them because they're normal 0, 1 in the prior. I'll say that again. We can use this trick to re-express this model so that the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo doesn't have to move around inside the distribution of alpha sub j. It just has to move around inside the distribution of z alpha uh, sub alpha comma j. And that has no parameters in it. It's, it has no hyperpriors. But it's the same model. I know this is a super weird trick, but it, it works. Uh, so we re-express the model <clears throat> in the so-called non-centered version on the right of this screen. These two models are the same model. They are mathematically identical, but when you use them in your computer to do uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, they're not equivalent. Uh, they reach the same answer eventually, but the one on the right is a lot more efficient. So let's code the model that way. The code looks worse uh, because it's got some extra lines, <clears throat> but it's much more efficient. Uh, the only thing to note here is um, I have expressed these deterministic relationships uh, for the alpha vector and beta vector. 
uh, uh, same length, and I put save in front of them so that we get them back in the posterior distribution, even though they're not true parameters because they're strictly functions of the other parameters, uh, alpha bar, beta bar, uh, z sub alpha, and uh, z sub beta, and sigma and tau. <clears throat> in this model samples uh, much better. And again, uh, the less efficient model works. You just ha would have to run it much longer to have the same confidence in the posterior samples you get. Okay, I know this is a, a strange trip, and it's just a weird fact about um, scientific research, as in art, that there's a bunch of technical stuff that's really annoying that you have to deal with to make things work and get the final beautiful product. And that's what this non-centering trick is like. If you run, you build your varying effects model based upon scientific principles and interests, some desired estimate, and then you have to wrestle with a Markov chain, uh, like this glass blower has to wrestle with all the details of, of melting temperature and ovens and putting things together in the right way and, and how much lead is in the glass and so on. Uh, but there's just no way of, to avoid that. If you want the beautiful end product, you have to deal with the technical monsters uh, in between. Uh, and that's what this varying effects trick is like. There are other things about estimation and finite samples, which are similarly just not what we got into this business for, uh, but in the end, it's all worth it. <clears throat> okay, and this is what we get. Uh, now we have, um, I'm repeating that same kind of structured plot from before where I'm showing the posterior predictive distributions for each district. But now I'm splitting it by rural and urban. So in the top plot, we have rural. Uh, all the districts are, are arrayed uh, from 1 to 61 on the horizontal axis, and then probability of using contraception on the vertical. And uh, this is not the same plot as before, uh, because we've, ta <coughs> we've taken out uh, the urban districts. Um, <coughs> and then on the bottom, we have the uh, urban districts, the same sort of plot uh, shown in blue. Uh, but only the urban parts of each district. There's a lot of complexity here and a lot to investigate, and we're not going to try to just deal, they're not going to try to uh, analyze this in too much detail. Just a few things I want to point out. Uh, first, let me label the really extreme uh, empirical values, the, the black dots, with their sample sizes like I did before. Uh, and this is the, the action of partial pooling, and there's a couple things to note here. Um, this is another chance to appreciate how partial pooling works. The cases where the sample sizes are small, you get a bigger difference between the red circle and the black circle because there's more shrinkage towards the mean because there's less evidence in that particular district. So you'll see uh, like in the top plot where you get sample sizes of four or seven or six, uh, there's a greater distance between the posterior mean in red and the em raw empirical <coughs> mean uh, in black. Uh, same is true on the bottom. Uh, we have even more extreme small sample sizes on the bottom, a number of districts where there's only two or three uh, women from urban areas because those districts aren't very urban. Uh, they only have small towns in them, really. Um, and this illustrates another factor about partial pooling is that as you begin to cut up a data set by stratifying by various predictors, and you will need to because you have some particular estimate in mind, uh, you're going to get smaller sample sizes in each unit. And in that case, partial pooling becomes increasingly valuable uh, because the shrinkage uh, guards against overfitting. Yeah. Uh, but the overall result here, uh, you probably appreciate it already, is that there's more contraceptive use. Uh, often a lot more in urban areas, but there's also a lot of variation in the urban areas. Uh, and it sort of seems like from eyeballing it, there's more variation uh, across um, urban areas of districts than there is across rural areas of districts. This is to say, on average, uh, women living in urban areas are, use contraception more, but they also vary more. So we can take a look at the sigma and tau parameters uh, for these um, effects, for these features. And that's what I've done here in the bottom half of this slide. These are the posterior distributions for uh, the sigma and tau, that is the standard deviations um, of the of rates of use across rural areas in red uh, and urban areas in blue. 
Uh, and then I've, I've added the prior here. This is something I often like to do in my own projects is superimpose the prior for a particular distribution to make sure that uh, the data did some work at all, right? You want to see some, uh, uh, you want to see the posterior move from the prior. Uh, so what's going on here, as you can see, is that actually <clears throat> there are many, there's a very wide range of standard deviations consistent with urban, and many of them are quite large. Um, there's much more evidence about what's going on in rural areas. Um, so this is not a confident assertion that there's more variation across urban areas because there's just less data from urban areas uh, from Bangladesh in 1989. It wasn't very urban at the time. Uh, uh, and you want to think of this as another example of the case where sometimes what the posterior distribution tells you is um, that it doesn't know uh, how much variation there is. And that's what you're seeing in the urban area. Uh, it could be consistent with low or high uh, or the same as rural. <clears throat> okay, a final thing to say about this as a bridge to the next lecture. Um, a more natural way, perhaps, to plot these posterior predictions is to have a graph like the one on the screen where the x-axis is the probability of contraceptive use in a rural area and the vertical is the probability of contraceptive use in the urban area and each point is a district. Yeah, so the a horizontal axis is computed using the alphas and the vertical axis is computed using the alphas plus the, the betas uh, for each district. Um, and what I've shown you so far is just the posterior means and those dashed lines that, that intersect there are showing you the uh, 50 percent uh, on each axis. So to the left we have less than half of women using contraception, to the right uh, uh, we have more, and above the midpoint line uh, we also have more than 50% using. So the first thing to appreciate, of course, is what you saw on the previous slides, is that there's more contraceptive use in urban areas. <clears throat> okay, the other thing, though, that's revealed now that was quite hard to see in the previous slides is that there's a strong positive correlation between contraceptive use um, in both rural and urban areas within a district. Yeah, you see that? I'll say that again. There's a strong positive correlation between contraceptive use in the rural and urban areas within each district. Yeah, and that's why this, uh, uh, this cloud of points uh, goes up to the right. And that correlation um, is extra information that we have not exploited in any particular way. I'm going to show you it. it's also a feature of the uncertainty about these points. So what I'm going to do next is impose the whole posterior distribution on here in the form of these 50% compatibility regions. This is not a beautiful plot, I know, but uh, what are these? These are 50% uh, uh, compatibility regions of the joint uncertainty from the joint posterior distribution of the alphas and alpha plus betas in each district, um, just to show you that they also tilt uh, up and to the right. There's a correlation in the uncertainty uh, of them as well. <clears throat> uh, this is a little easier to appreciate if we just subsample down to about six of them, and you can see it better here. Um, this correlation both in the posterior means and the whole posterior distributions of these parameters alpha and beta is information that we can use to make even better estimates actually uh, but i'm going to leave that story for the next lecture because it's a bit involved um, but but the good news is that there's more information on the table and we can do even better uh, with tinkering with the machinery using the right pencils uh, to draw the owl okay to summarize, um, what I've tried to show you here is examples of how to develop additional features into a multi-level model and how to think about, begin to think about the covariation among those features. So in this case, the features are rural versus urban within each district. And in the next lecture, I'm going to show you how to do some, uh, get some extra value uh, out of the joint uncertainty uh, in the features. Okay, we're in week seven. Uh, week seven, we're doing uh, yet more multi-level models, and this will be a launching point to keep going forward into special topics that use these estimation technologies uh, in future weeks. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>